Everybody introducing Chris. Oh, how are you guys doing tonight? I'm Chris, and I'm an alcoholic. August 6, uh, 2020 is my sobriety date, and uh, yes, this is my first time uh, sharing my story. So I'm a little nervous here, but uh, just bear with me. You got me for the next 50 minutes, and I don't know. Thanks, Eric. Uh, thanks for all the you know kind words, and Jeff for reading how it works. And thank you guys for all being here tonight. Um, I'm very grateful uh, to be here. Uh, with a little over a year sobriety to share my experience, strength, and hope uh, with you guys tonight. Um, you know, in the past year, I've learned a lot about myself. I've learned a lot about my alcoholism. And through this program, through these meetings, through everybody's shares, um, through my sponsor, through reading things, I've learned and gained a lot of tools to help me maintain uh, my sobriety. So with that, I'll get started here. So I was born uh, 1975 here in the Dallas uh, Fort Worth area. Um, I was born to a very small uh, family. Um, I was an only child uh, and aside from that I just had a mom, a dad, um, on my dad's side of the family just an aunt and on my mom's side of the family my grandparents my great-grandparents and an uncle and that was it so um, you know for me all of my life alcohol has always been present in some form or fashion and so with that I'm gonna actually kind of back up and give you a little bit of the history on my mom's side of the family and my dad's side of the family so um, see my great-grandparents moved back to Dallas after the Great uh, Depression and, uh, uh, you know, set roots actually in the house where we live in uh, to this day. Now, my great-grandparents, they were not alcoholics. On my mom's side of the family, see, it seems to skip every other generation. So, my grandparents, on the other hand, oh yeah, they were alcoholics. My mom's not. Uh, however, she is, I guess, kind of what we call a dry drunk. She has all the character defects but she doesn't drink and um, and then there's me alcoholic so uh, I, I knew my great-grandparents for just a little bit my great-grandma she passed away when I was only five and I was 11 when great-granddad but uh, passed away but you know they were just they were just the good grandparents they just were they were just down-to-earth people so then let's go to my grandparents now they were very stereotypical 1950s uh very conservative you know here in texas uh family um my grandfather you know he 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 was an old man uh you know he worked in the oil business uh, he retired as executive with a oil company he worked at the Meadows building here, which at the time was the only high rise outside of downtown. And so there's a little bit of prestige, you know, associated with that. My grandmother, she, a nano, she was a very much a conservative country club, you know, token wife. Okay, she didn't work, uh, you know, her, she really don't wanna raise kids. Uh, you know, her, her thing was, shopping at Neiman Marcus and going to the country club and doing the country club type of thing. All right. So they had two kids, my mom and my uncle. Now here's the thing. My uncle, he was gay. And that was back in that type of uh, environment. That was very much, um, you know, swept under the rug. It was it was not talked about. It definitely wasn't talked about at the, uh, you know, country club. I say this because later on in my life, it would actually create uh, a lot of issues, you know, for me. Um, and then there's mom. Now, mom was a very quiet, introverted uh, individual. You know, she, she had very low self-esteem. And, but that's okay. She had granddad. She had, you know, her daddy always took care of her so um, 
I don't know. She she just never she just had that. So that's my mom's side. Now my dad's side, my dad and my aunt, they were orphaned at a very young age. Um, the state deemed that their parents were not fit, uh, so they were taken away and put into this uh, orphanage over on the east side of Dallas. The reason that his parents were not fit is because they were full-blown alcoholics. Now I say that because I really don't know, we don't know much of the history of my you know, grandmother on that side, but my grandfather, and I only just recently found out a lot of this history, but uh, you know, my grandfather on that side, he, he, he had a very colorful history. Uh, you know, he served in World War II. Uh, he was shot down in the war. Um, he, um, you know, uh, was, you know, captured, was served in a POW camp, uh, was liberated by the Russians, I guess, stole an airplane across the enemy lanes. I mean, this is kind of the stuff the movies are made of, really. And, um, and then after he got out of the war, he, he was a very young, charming, charismatic alcoholic. He slept with a lot of women, made a lot of babies, and uh, along the way. <laughs> my dad and my aunt were two of them. And, uh, you know, I would later learn that he ended up pretty much being disgraced uh, from the family. Uh, and he died in 1978 of alcoholism, uh, apparently a very lonely individual. Um, so that's pretty much all I know. But again, there's more, you know, there's that alcoholism component into the, into the family tree. So my dad grew up in this orphanage and it, he, he did have a sponsor family, um, uh, but he was never adopted out. So the sponsor family would basically, uh, maybe a couple weekends a month, uh, you know, they would take him for a day or two and he would get to see the outside world outside of this orphanage. Um, but here's the thing, his sponsor family, they were hardcore alcoholics as well. So when he got to see the real world outside of the orphanage, it was all about alcoholism. So my dad, yeah, of course he would grow up to be an alcoholic. He still is an alcoholic, you know, to this day, still practicing alcoholic, I mean to say. So. So my dad, you know, he, but one thing he learned in this orphanage was kind of the, the fight for survival type of thing. And so when he uh, graduated, you know, when they turned 18, this was in the, uh, this was in the 60s. And all the guys that he grew up with, most of them were sent off to Vietnam. Most of them did not make it back. My dad survived because he got a baseball scholarship and went out to Texas Tech where he got his business degree. And, um, and that's where he met my mom. So, you know, they say opposites attract because my dad is a very charismatic, very extroverted, very social, funny, uh, you know, individual. And then mom's the complete opposite. So they would come together, uh, you know, start their family, start their lives. And in 1975, they had me. Now, I was the only one who survived. They had had several attempts. I was the only one who would survive. And even at that, I barely survived myself. So with that, mom would hang on to me, and she kind of still does, <laughs> hang on to me for dear life. So, you know, as a kid growing up, alcohol was always present. It was in the fridge. My dad drank course and he drank a lot of it. Um, you know, there, there were times where uh, he would be out, you know, throwing this old Sears weed whacker that we had around the driveway, uh, trying to get the thing to work. And mom would tell me, go to the fridge, get your dad a beer. So I would. She would open it up and on the way out to, to the driveway, I would take a sip or two of this beer. That was my first experience. I'm less than five years old and I'm already you know, having a few sips of quarters back then. Uh, I thought, man, beer, man, this stuff's nasty. But you know what? It's an adult thing. It's a grown-up thing to do. And this is so cool. I'm being a grown-up. I'm four years old, but I'm being a grown-up here. So other thing that I saw is that, you know, when Dad would have that beer, it would calm him down. And then he would get his yard work done. I was like, oh, okay. This is kind of working. All right. So... Yeah, the, you know, all this time, um, 
what happened in that first five years is mom she just started and I, I want to make it actually real clear here real quick I do not blame my parents for anything I don't blame them for my alcoholism or anything like that they did the best with what they knew how to do but you know mom had some hard times you know with you know me barely surviving and the others that she uh, and like I said she's kind of a dry drunk she she's maybe had maybe a bottle of champagne a bottle of wine in her entire life but her addiction is cheeseburgers and sugar and you know she she started uh, you know putting on the pounds um, you know after she had me now my dad who had commitment issues but you know he he was out there and he was starting to cat around so you know by the time I was five uh, they got a divorce and that had a very hard impact on me growing up because now I wanted to be with dad because dad was funny charismatic charming all that stuff but I'm stuck with mom and you know mom would be primarily the one who would raise me and you know I, I, I started to get just a lot of these kind of character defects and stuff if you will uh, you know from from her and again I don't want to blame her for this but but it's it's just it's the way I was raised um, she she went she really protected me um, you know I she sent me to this private school uh, this this really conservative uh, Christian uh, school in in over in Arlington and uh, but yet my mom is an atheist agnostic you know type she she didn't know what she was sending me into um, and you know I I learned in the school it was you know that this uh, you know this fearing God thing you know if you said a bad word or you know, used his name in vain. You had to stop and pray it away right then and there. Um, you know, my sex ed was, you know, an animated video of a of a uh, stork delivering a baby to an upstairs, you know, bedroom. <laughs> I mean, this is the stuff I was, but I didn't know any different. This is what I grew up in. Uh, you know, this was, I was in my bubble, and I was quite fine in that bubble. I mean, towards the end of it, of my time in that school, I mean. I was singing Jesus songs like a canary, you know. <laughs> you know, I didn't know any different. But yet, I still cherished the time when I got to see Dad twice a week. So Dad would come over, he would come pick us up, and uh, you know, take us out to dinner. And I, you know, and I just remember as a kid on the way to El Chico, every night we would stop by Big Daddy's over in uh, Western Arlington on the Arlington Fort Worth line. And, uh, you know, back then we had dry and wet areas in, in Texas. And, you know, so you had to drive clear across town to, you know, get anything with liquor in it. And we were stopped by Big Daddy's. And, uh, you know, that was my first experience with the liquor store. And I loved it because it had a certain smell. And you all know exactly what I'm talking about. A liquor store, just like Toys R Us, <laughs> has a certain smell. And I loved it as a kid. You know, I was, you know, playing in the wine section with the, with the, uh, you know, the plastic grape leaves and these plastic little grapes. My God, that was cool. And here's the best part. It was an adult thing. You know, this is, I knew that liquor and alcohol was an adult thing. And I wanted to grow up. So, anyway, that's a little side note there. So, I, um, you know, in the mid, in the mid 80s, uh, middle of sixth grade, uh, we, my great grandfather passed away. We inherited that house. We moved over here to Dallas. And I went from this little bubble at the this, at this school to the Highland Park Independent School District. And that was a rough transition for me. I was at that very, very awkward stage in life. I was just you know approaching puberty. And I go from my little bubble of a school to this public school. Now, here's the thing. I didn't know how to fend for myself. I, you know, I didn't play sports growing up. Mom didn't let me play sports. She was afraid I was going to get hurt. Her baby was going to get hurt. So I didn't learn these things that young kids learn, uh, you know, playing sports. Um, I just, my, my social skills were, 
were not developed. And it was, it was a challenge, to say the least, going into this public school system. I was bullied like crazy. I was picked on like crazy. You know, there was a point where, you know, I wouldn't go to the bathroom because I was afraid of getting picked on. I wouldn't go to lunch because I was scared. I had I started developing this thing called fear. And I was scared. So I found this stairwell to go hide in during lunch. Did anybody know if I was missing? No. Did the administrators, teachers really do anything about it? No. I got away with that for a while. I found a comfort in that stairwell that I would later in life find that same comfort in the bottle of alcohol. So, you know, I'm, I'm going through puberty here and I'm starting to learn my sexuality. Well, I'll bring Uncle Gary back into this, into this picture because now we're, you know, in the, in the latter half of the 1980s here. We're in the height of the AIDS crisis and my uncle, he passes away from the AIDS virus in 1988. So it was very, from my grandparents' side of things, it was very swept under the rug. I, had, I had just I had a very hard time trying to accept my sexuality in this because it's just something that wasn't talked about. So that would later kind of come back to haunt me and I would end up living kind of sort of two lives, you know, later on down, uh, you know, as a result of that. Um, so something happened around ninth grade or so, and that was uh, my Wednesdays and Saturdays were my day with my dad. We had gone down to a, uh, a uh, uh, art festival in downtown Fort Worth, and there it was, glistening in the sun, my very first margarita truck. <laughs> Dad had asked me, uh, because then you could, uh, in Texas, uh, you know, parent or legal guardian can sell you or give, provide their minor, you know, all the alcohol you want. He's like, son, you ever had a margarita? Well, I know, Dad, I never have. All right, well, here you go. That led to my very first blackout, because I have no idea how we made it back to my dad's house. My father has no idea how we made it back to his house that night. And the next day, I had my first hangover, and that was a tequila hangover, and that was just awful. I thought, well, I'm never going to do this again. Yeah, I guess what, that didn't last. <laughs> I found a certain strength, if you will, in alcohol um, from having, a, you know, a very low self-esteem myself, having a, a kind of a, a social, uh, lack of social skills, and, and being that just awkward kind of dorky, if you will, kid. I found a certain power in alcohol, and it felt great. Um, that, I mean, I, at this young age, I'm already well into developing my, uh, you know, alcoholic brain. Um, you know, we, I went, uh, uh, you know, after sophomore year, high school, uh, my uh, friend Paul and I, his parents, were uh, chaperones on this uh, month-long Europe trip is for the senior, uh, senior AP class. And, uh, you know, so we got to tag along. And I thought, this is great. You know, my alcoholic brain has already got all these, you know, is, is already working hard at this. I'm going to go over into Europe for a whole month. There's no drinking age over there. Uh, you know, or at least at the time, there was a much lower drinking age. I'm going to go over there and I'm going to drink my way around, around Europe. This is going to be awesome. You know, and we get over there. I mean, we're not even an hour in Spain, you know, at the hotel. And Paul and I are already downstairs at the hotel restaurant ordering a bottle of wine. We were the first ones down there. Now, the chaperones arrived shortly after about the same time that the bottle of wine did. And needless to say, that night we did not have any wine. But um, we did learn during the trip that as the chaperones would, you know, start to have their evening cocktails. And they would start to loosen up. That they would then let us, you know, have a little bit here and there. And they would let the seniors, uh, you know, they would kind of let them have some you know, uh, drinking parties and stuff like that. And so, we, you know, as this month trip progressed and, you know, as we progressed with Europe, things, you know, kind of sort of loosened up and we were, 
<clears throat> able to drink a little bit more and more. Where's the other thing? One of the other chaperones on this trip, Mrs. T. She was a science teacher uh, at the high school. And, you know, she was a you know, chaperone. She was a cougar. I mean, she loved having all these seniors. And she was an alcoholic. So Miss T, she had two suitcases with her. She had one for her clothes, and then the other was a liquor cabinet with wheels on it. And, you know, that's where we went around here. So Paul and I quickly learned, you know, in the evening time, as she's down on her, you know, umpteen cocktails, that when she would run dry, hey, uh, you know, we'll take the room key, and uh, we'll go, we'll go, you know, re refill your cocktail. So we would. We'd go up to her room, and she would have, the, you know, I mean, it looked like JR's, you know, on the freaking dresser. <laughs> <clears throat> we beat this Marine for like two nights. But, um, yeah, so, you know, we'd pour a cocktail and we'd take a little nip for ourselves. And, hey, that worked. Man, this is great. I mean, this is a sophomore of high school and I'm already, you know, doing shots of whatever. So, uh, you know, that, I would, after that Europe trip and stuff, I still kind of had a hard time in high school, you know, still fitting in, but I would, I would just kind of start to develop my own, um, kind of my own identity, if you will. Um, once I became 16, I, I found something, I'd always had an interest in aviation, and now I was able to pursue that interest in aviation. And this allowed me to, for, in essence, grow up. Uh, you know, so I, and it was a great excuse because I didn't have to do the extracurricular activities in high school. Nope, after class is done, I was off, you know, to Grand Prairie to take flying lessons, uh, you know, after school. So I, I, you know, I worked up, I worked up my way, you know, through, through getting uh, some flying done there. I graduated high school and then it was time, that was the point where I really spread my wings. Um, I went to, I enrolled out to Aviation uh, University out in Daytona Beach, Florida. And this was just perfect. Um, I'm going to Florida, I'm going to Beach Town, and this school has 10 guys to every one girl. And beer and all that stuff was just readily available. What can go wrong here? Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I, so here we are freshman year, and I, you know, there was three of us per dorm room uh, pretty small uh, dorm rooms, actually, uh, three of us per room. And, uh, you know, we, we, we got a hold of a case of beer, a couple of cases of beer, that kind of thing. And one night, that's when I have my second blackout. Uh, you know, I, I don't know, so I don't remember it, but that's also where, I don't know if y'all heard, you know, Krista's story um, a couple weeks ago, and she had talked about the Bedwetters Club. Well, that night is when I joined the Bedwetters Club. <laughs> the only thing was, it wasn't my bed that I got wet. I somehow in this blackout climbed out of my bed, went across the room, climbed up onto the foot of my roommate's bed, and my roommate was in the bed at the time, and uh, let go, did what I had to do. You know, <laughs> I mean, come on, seriously. You know, this, I mean, I'm like, but I'm not an alcoholic. I don't have a problem here. Anyway, so college would, um, yeah, it would, uh, you know, continue with the, uh, you know, the, the, this kind of sort of the standard college thing, the frat parties and, uh, you know, alcohol was readily available. I mean, I, the place where I flight instructed at and, uh, you know, worked at, I, he, he, you know, he was this Florida party guy and he would have these, he would host these hangar parties and, you know, just kegs and kegs and kegs of beer and, uh, you know, we would we would throw these big hangar parties on the weekends, and um, you know, I remember for you know like a month after he'd have these hangar parties. I mean, the whole hangar smelled like New Orleans. It was you know, and even been New Orleans, you know what that smells like. But it was, I mean, that was that was college, all right. I my best friend in uh, college. Uh, he was you know this big old heavy set Greek guy. And uh, he worked. Uh, he worked a back door at this, uh, you know, at this uh, titty bar, Molly Brown's. And I would go in there because they didn't card me. I could drink all I wanted in there, and I'm under 21. It didn't matter. And the other benefit is I could hang out behind him, or I mean, behind the bar where he was, you know, working. And right above it was a gay bar. And I was really curious about this gay bar. See, 
I knew about my sexuality, but I hadn't come out yet. And I was too scared to. I was too afraid of what people would think of me. But damn it, I was curious. I could go into Molly Brown's here and have a few drinks and then come out here and watch all the cute guys going up and down the stairs. And uh, yeah, so I just started getting like a little bit more curious about this, you know, about the whole gay bar thing. Again, I still was hiding that uh, from my friends. Um, yeah, then I turned 21, uh, and actually before that, I even, uh, for some other places, I did get a fake ID. A friend of mine uh, who had reached 21 before me um, sold me his uh, old driver's license, and you know, so for a period of time, I was Patrick. I was five foot eight, and I was from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. <laughs> but it worked. <laughs> no one apparently checked enough. Um, you know, come come my 21st birthday, guess what? Dad's there. I'll call it Dad's there. And, uh, you know, he, uh, you know, he rents out this keg and big old house party. And, you know, there was like, this is like blackout number three because I don't remember it. I mean, it was all videotape, but I don't remember. I was running down the street throwing birthday cake at people at the end of the night. And, uh, you know, I don't remember these things. But, um, so I was definitely, you know, developing this hardcore relationship with alcohol uh, you know it's still a relatively young age and I've still got 27 years to go of this whole thing um, something else happened you know towards as I started getting towards the end of my college career uh, the curiosity would go into the gay bar and and actually meeting guys it just it finally kind of got to me and and I went to my first gay bar like uh, almost into my senior year and I was scared beyond belief going into there. And, you know, I drove around probably 20 times, you know, out around the street and finally parked and went in. And then, guess what? All I needed was a few drinks, that liquid courage. And, and then, wow, this is cool. I was in heaven. So, uh, yeah, for the rest of that time, I started selling my wild oats, and then I got my internship, came back here uh, to Dallas for four months, and then I found, I knew it was all down here, the whole neighborhood, um, Cedar Springs and Throckmorton, and man, I'll tell you what, I had arrived. I knew to get down here early enough to so I could find parking, and I knew to limit myself on the number of drinks, you know, so that way... I could kind of get that, get that edge off, and then, man, it was it was a fun time. I, I, I was out three, four, five nights, six nights, seven nights a week, <laughs> you know. And you know, back in those days, the hangovers, I don't know. I was just I was young, and the hangovers didn't last. I could function pretty quick the next day. Um, so I did that, and then. You know, I just had one, one semester to finish up back in uh, Florida. Now I'm starting to live kind of a double life. I'm still not out to my friends, but I'm really enjoying the whole gay life over here because it's, it's, it's me. Um, so I was living kind of these two different lives, and I, I started to abandon my friends. I only had, you know, a semester to go, and I'm over here enjoying, you know, I'm driving every weekend, uh, you know, down from Daytona Beach down to Orlando, going to all the gay bars in Orlando. You know, here it is, you know, three, four o'clock in the morning, and I'm driving back home. It's an hour drive, you know, and I mean, I'm smelling like liquor and lube, and I <laughs> managed to not ever get a DUI in that, you know. I was, I was cutting things close by all means, but yeah. You know what? I got through it, and I guess it's that. Uh, oh well, I I'm kind of invincible with this. So, okay, again, I don't have a problem here. I I never never identified it then. So, anyway, um, yeah, I graduated college, and uh, you know, going to the airline business. And back then, the airline business was really good. Uh, the you know, but here's the thing: I was the junior guy. And I got sent to the junior base. And for my airline, that junior base was Cleveland, Ohio. So all my life, I lived here in Texas. 
I lived in Florida, and now I'm going to Cleveland. Um, it's kind of a rude awakening, really. Uh, Cleveland is, I learned to appreciate Cleveland, you know, towards the end, but uh, for being a young guy in his young 20s, Cleveland was a rather depressing place, actually. Uh, it didn't have that organized gay scene. Uh, winters lasted, you know, eight months out of the year, it felt like. And it, it just, there was, I don't know, it was just kind of a gloomy place. Um, but you know what? I found the gay bars there. And, you know, the, I don't know, I, that's to sound pretentious, but, the, you know, the pickings were kind of slim. There, weren't, there just wasn't a lot of young, you know, guys my age, and, and my, probably like 10 or 15 of us in the whole city felt like, that's okay, a little bit of alcohol. Liquid courage, you know, it started to, it didn't matter because it just started making more friends. Um, you know, I got, I got into a place where I was kind of like lonely and all the while I'm, I'm doing this whole gay bar thing, you know, going, I'm living two lives because again, I just was not comfortable ever coming out of the closet. I still had that fear. So at work, you know, I come off pretty good as a straight guy. So at work, they just, they thought I was just one of the straight guys. And, um, and I just, I was never comfortable coming out. So I lived two different lives. As a result of that, I didn't make or have a whole lot of friends at work that I hung out with outside of work. So I was definitely living, you know, this, this two life, this two life thing. Um, but I got lonely, you know, on my days off. Uh, you know, I ended up in this relationship for a year and a half, and it was just, uh, it just wasn't a good relationship. There was just a lot of ingredients in this relationship that was not good. Um, uh, but you know what's funny is that during that year and a half, though, I really didn't drink a whole lot. Uh, maybe just like a few weekends here and there. But it, it, I don't know, it just seemed like my, I kind of cooled off on my drinking there for a bit. Uh, and then same thing, that relationship ended, and... Uh, you know, at that point, my my drinking was just maybe one night, you know, Friday night or Saturday night. I bet my schedule have you know the weekends off kind of thing, and you know, but I would go out, you know, to the bar and and, and definitely, you know, do some drinking, and then I would drive, you know, an hour home. How I got away with it for so many years, I have no idea. But um, then I ended up relationship number two. And it was an okay relationship, but it, it ran its course after after a couple of years. And at the end of that relationship, um, I had started to make more and more friends in the Cleveland uh, area. Uh, some of these people were airline people, and then their whole group of friends. And so I just kind of really came into this group, and. You know, I moved, I lived like an hour outside of town, 45 minutes outside of town. <clears throat> so I moved up into, you know, the quote-unquote neighborhood, if you will, in Cleveland, uh, in a ring suburb, Lakewood, over on the west side. And, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, kind of the gay-friendly city. It was close to the one halfway decent gay bar that we had. And, you know, it was just, it was great. Everything that we had was we had our, our our group and everything did involve alcohol alcohol was just a way of life alcohol became kind of the norm uh you know for us it, alcohol was more than just going out to the bars alcohol was you know the pool parties on the saturday alcohol was you know the the mimosas uh you know on the sunday brunches it just became a norm um but we were hanging out at the bar a lot, and that's where Jeff and I met. He used to work. Uh, he was a bar bag at the, at the one bar. And, you know, I was chasing after him for a while. Uh, he kept turning me away because he just thought I was a bar fly. And, <clears throat> and yeah, I was. But um, he, uh, it took a friend, a mutual friend, making a mutual friend that actually introduced the two of us, you know, together and got him to actually talk to me. And, you know, from there, our relationship just took off. Uh, we were like, you know, peas and carrots. And, 
and we he was part of this group and it was just life was great you know for for us then you know i'm in my i'm in my 30s now and i've got a good job and i'm getting a good schedule you know and i've got a wonderful you know relationship and but something else started to happen and that was um on the career side of things see my aspirations were at the time i was working for what we call a regional airline and it's just kind of like a stepping stone up to the major airline status but i kind of already been burned a few times i had been burned by you know the events of september 11th in terms of the industry downturn and furloughs and and that kind of thing and then the great recession uh you know really hit the uh airline industry hard so i had i developed this fear of advancing my career my colleagues were starting to when when they could they were my colleagues were you know taking biting the bullet and going to advance their career at the you know at the majors but no not chris chris was chris had every i mean i had a great group of friends i had the relationship we had the bar it was life was just great i didn't want to change any of that so i just i got kind of stuck in that for many years meanwhile my colleagues are sitting here advancing and i'm just over here the reason i bring that up is because later on i would end up developing a lot of regret over that and i would still just had that fear of advancing my career so anyway um you know all this the the alcoholism just seems to be getting a little bit worse you know i've it it, it truly is a progressive disease and it was really sneaking up on me um you know there just started to be more of the you know the blackouts these little mini blackouts and and stuff like that um but here's the thing we had this one friend who was compared to us he was a uh, a much further along alcoholic and the mistake that we all made was we all compared ourselves to this one friend that we had um because we weren't as bad as him we weren't passed out by five six o'clock in the evening you know we weren't leaving the house in the afternoon taking out 10 parked cars in front of his house on the way to go get more liquor uh we didn't isolate ourselves at home by ourselves like he did uh you know i mean he would he was he was a pie so he'd sober up for work and then he had three four days off and he would just go on the bender of all benders i mean he you know he was that guy that um we uh you know i remember one time we were at a you know at an afternoon sunday cookout and you know he would disappear you know for a few hours go pass out on the couch and then he he would re-emerge but we had taken all the liquor and we hid it from him we knew where it was but we'd hid it from him and uh you know but he was definitely in search of it he went to the picnic table and he found this bottle of olive oil and he's sitting there chugging this olive oil i mean you know that's an alcoholic and we weren't alcoholics because we didn't do stuff like that um he just kept getting worse and worse i mean he almost burned his house down you know with microwave and chicken nuggets you remember that one jeff it was he put him it was supposed to go on for five minutes he set the timer for 50 and uh, that, was, that was a mess so here's the thing um you know with him he uh this is one like a little funny bit he he kept a gun and a dildo under his bed which is a bad idea for an alcoholic <laughs> we took the gun away because we didn't want him to hurt himself but we were still a little concerned if somebody breaks in his house god well, he's going to be out there waving but he'll be drunk out there waving this you know thing you know from some perpetrator but anyway <laughs> yeah that but we weren't like that so we were okay we weren't alcoholics um 
you know, he, I, I talk a lot about him because here's the thing, he, he had an alcoholic seizure and DTs, and he lost his, his, his career temporarily for that. Uh, because you can't get medically certified, you know, with, with a seizure. Um, he, uh, make sure I'm okay on time here. Uh, you know, so he, uh, uh, you know, we, we had some programs in the airline, and we were able to get him, you know, back. But he had to go to rehab, and he had to go to this thing called AA. Now, we didn't know what, I kind of sort of heard about AA, but we really didn't know about it. But he was the first one to go into AA. He was the first one to sober up. And, you know, he has many more years of sobriety, you know, than we do. Um, so, yeah, that was Andy. Uh, what would happen here with me uh, is we would, I guess I need to pick up the pace here. Um, <laughs> We moved 2014. Uh, this was all now the process of trying to, you know, swear off the hard liquor, go back to the beer and wine. God knows we tried that so many times and it didn't work. We moved here. We had the opportunity to move back to Dallas through 2014. And now the alcoholism just has really taken off. Um, by the point in 2018, uh, you know, I had just become like our friend Andy. I was. I was in between trips. I was going on benders of all benders. And then I would just knew to s when to sober up just enough time. So I'd go back to work, be sober. And then as soon as I got home, guess what? It was rinse, repeat. I didn't advance my career because I was freaking drunk when I was at home. I, uh, you know, and I started to develop a lot of regret. I saw my colleagues moving up and I'm just stuck in this, in this merry-go-round of alcoholism. Um, I uh, I had my first accident uh, in 2018, uh, and that was just on a drunk bender. I fell and broke my leg, and I have no idea. It was a total blackout when I did that. Um, in the hospital, I had, uh, you know, I was in the hospital for like a week, and that's when I first learned more about AA. I learned my my first nurse. He was. He was an AA in Lambda. And at that time, I didn't reach out because I'm in control, a, a big control thing for me. I was always in control. I can control my way through this. And you know what? I did say, stay sober for 11 months. But after that, we went to a wedding and had a few cocktails. We decided to be okay. We'll, 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 we'll work with each other and have a few cocktails, so we did. And you know what? It started right back up, right where we had left off, um, to the point that now we're getting into the pandemic. It's April, everything's gonna be shut down, and what are we doing? We're at Seagal's buying cases and cases of liquor because you know, this stuff might be closed. And that liquor went so quick and, you know, then we try the control drinking. Oh, let's buy the 750 instead of the 1.75. Well, you know what? The 1.75 is a better and more value for your money. So, uh, you know, so we buy the, you know, the bigger bottles. And, and then, again, trying the swearing off everything uh, and just back to beer and wine. None of it worked. And then I started lying. I started, you know, oh, well, I'm, I'm quitting drinking now or just drinking beer. And I started hiding liquor. Um, and that's when I had my last drink. I was hiding liquor under the house, bottle of vodka under the house. And, <clears throat> you know, it's a morning. I'm having a few swigs. Because that's right. He would go to work, and I would, I would go to work on the bottle. And, uh, yeah, I uh, apparently had too much. I passed out in the floor of my closet where the crawl space was to, you know, get. And uh, he couldn't reach me. He called my mom. She came over, and mom found me passed out in the floor of the closet. That was my last drink. That was at the point where I knew I had to do something. So when I came into this program, I had the full willingness 
I was 110% powerless over alcohol. My life had become unmanageable. Something had to change. He was about to divorce me. Um, you know, I, I couldn't control the alcohol. It just, so I did one thing. I remembered the AA from Andy's experience. And I remembered the nurse telling me, um, you know, from the hospital about the Lambda group. And at this point, we're in the height of the pandemic. So I went online, I found their meetings, the meeting schedule. And I went to my first meeting. I had no clue how this program worked or what to expect. But I went on to that meeting. And it was a speaker meeting. Eric was chairing. Ed Moody was, uh, was sharing his story that night. And the only thing that I, basically, pretty much after, you know, kind of at the end of the meeting, meeting some people online, is I was just told one thing. Come back tomorrow to another meeting. That's all it took. Just come back to another meeting. So we did. And we started coming back to more and more meetings. Then the whole under the tree thing started uh, to happen. So we started coming to the, uh, to the coffee shop uh, meetings here. You know, under the tree, I started meeting more people in person. And that's where I met Eric. And, um, you know, I remember, I, I, I thought he was the first, I thought he was actually the nurse from the hospital. Uh, he wasn't, but I thought at first he was. And uh, anyway, so I thought about, uh, you know, I need to, I'm just told I need to find a sponsor. And, uh, you know, I was thinking of asking him, he came up to me, he was like, hey, have you found a sponsor yet? <laughs> Uh, well, no, you know, as a matter of fact, uh, yeah. So that's when our relationship began, and I asked him to be my sponsor. After that, he took me along the journey. You know, step one, I was already there. I did have a little hang-up here in the step two with the whole God thing, and that's because, uh, you know, from my background and, and, and uh, you know, with this religious school, I did have, I did have a hard time with the whole you know, God thing. But um, anyway, I, we worked through it. I started having spiritual experiences in step five. I learned what my higher power was. And we just, it's been a beautiful thing working the program. And without his strength, experience, and hope, I would not be here today. Uh, you know, and without the experience, strength, and hope of everybody in this room, I would not be here today. So I know I've run out of, I've run out of time here, so um, I, will get, I will get off the stage and, you know, thank you guys.